good to be here. It's good to be with you guys. We're in the middle of a journey through the Old Testament. We've started in Genesis. We're now as far as 1 Chronicles chapter 16. So if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to, to open up. If you don't have a Bible, it's underneath the seat in front of you. There's some Bibles available for you. You're, you're welcome to grab one of those and uh, join along with us. I, I think it's always beneficial as we're going through the Word that it's not you just hearing it, but also you know, with your eyes taking it in and knowing that this isn't what I'm saying, it's what God's saying. It's his truth that we want to unfold and unveil. And so that, that's, a, I think, a, another aspect of, you know, us maturing in our faith is getting to know our Bibles, man. When we're flipping around, you, you get to know, you know, how to navigate through your Bible. And I, I think that's a, that's a cool um, opportunity to to just become familiar with the word of God and so I mean I encourage you guys to to join along we're in the 16th chapter now remember what's happened up until this point first chronicles second chronicles is looking at the kings of Judah specifically first and second kings takes all the kings of Israel both uh both northern and 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 the southern kingdom but now we're very much focusing in first chronicles on the southern kingdom where king david is established as the king his throne is now in jerusalem that they've now overtaken and in a very short time david's been established as the king of of not only the 12 tribes at this point but for the very first time, all of the tribes, you know, in agreement and in, and in unity, and God is beginning to do this incredible work there in Jerusalem. Now, what, what's, what's amazing is that David had a love for God. He, th- th- this is the guy who would be out on, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the middle of nowhere, and he would be a worshiper. Most of the Psalms are written by King David. He was, he was a psalmist. He, and, and the, you know, we're going to be looking at some of the psalms this, this evening there in First Chronicles chapter 16. And it's really, you know, David expressing his, his worship of God, his, his love for God. I, I, I'm convinced that David would have replaced this idea of being a king to be a priest. <laughs> because, you know, you just everywhere you turn around, D- David's looking for an opportunity to, to worship God. He's, he's looking for opportunities to to just pour out his heart to God. When we get to chapter 15, if you remember back, he had brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David, which would have been God's presence. And it it was something that David longed for. He wanted God's presence everywhere he he would go. And and now he's going to have God's presence now outside of his window. You know, it was going to be in his backyard. He, He wanted God's presence, you know, somewhere where he would always be able to uh, you know, lift up the name of the Lord and, and worship the Lord. And David had th- this longing to do so. And now in chapter 16, he is offering for the first time the sacrifices as they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And as he's doing so, you know, one of the things you, you, you notice about David, it, it, I think this is the highlight of his, of his life. It's, it's one of those times, if you would have talked to David his old age, that, that time we brought the ark home. You know, that, 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 was, that, was, that was the moment. That, you know, that was the time because he's going to now, you know, have this opportunity to declare God's goodness to the nation. Notice what happens, chapter 16. Check this out. So they brought the ark of God. They set it in the midst of the tabernacle. Now, that would have been tents, guys. It wasn't, it would would have just been, you know, just a a, a covering for God's presence to be in. And then he says this, that David had erected for it, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And now, you know, you, you kind of look at the, this, this event that's taking place. They're, they're, they're offering up sacrifices. They're, they're the burnt offerings. They're, they're now, you know, just 
cleansing themselves. And now as David had offered the burnt offering and the peace offering for the Lord, now he's able to bless the people. It's not possible to bless the people unless first you've been set apart. You've been sanctified. You've been, you know, in the presence of God yourself. And now, so David now, as he's been doing these things, he's now, you know, inviting the rest of the congregation, the rest of the, the nation to join in and, and to be blessed as he has been seeking the face of God and the heart of God. And then in verse three, he says, and he distributed to everyone of Israel, both men and women, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. Now, I think it's something that, that happens when, when people are in communion and fellowship is food has to be involved. <laughs> You're going to give them a piece of meat, a loaf of bread, and a cake of dessert was included in this, in this time of fellowship, right? They're, they're, they're breaking bread together. They're, you know, eating meat together, and they're, they're, they're there having the... the, the Cake of raisins. Now, if, if you guys know anything about fellowship here at church, man, it, it, like food is everywhere, right? Just, it's always part of everything. And so, you know, I think it, it, there's just something that happens when we, when we spend that kind of time together. And now, you know, they're not only fellowshipping with God, but they're, you know, building their relationship amongst one another as they're worshiping God, one heart, one mind. They're watching all of this take place. And then in verse 4, he says, And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. And so David now is, is like, man, th th this, this is going to be an ongoing event. When we get to the end of the chapter, he says he now assigns people that every day they would be out there worshiping the Lord. Every day they would be out there offering the sacrifices, blowing the trumpets, playing the stringed instruments. It was going to be a daily event, morning and evening. Because, because he was longing, you know, for, for God's presence. And I don't know about you, but when, when I'm just overwhelmed with life and issues and problems and the things going on around me and having to make decisions and, you know, having to deal with issues. And I, one of, the, one of the, the place that I run to is just to be able to sit at the feet of the Lord to turn on some worship music, just to kind of, you know, find a place where I can just be in his presence, being at church when we're worshiping together. You know, th those are places of, of just safety, right? And, and, you know, David now wants that every day. You know, it was going to be right outside of his door, you know, right, right there in, in his city. He's going to have this morning and evening sacrifice that he's going to be able to go and enter into the presence of God. And he's appointing people to accomplish that on a regular, right? Look at verse 5. Asaph, the chief, the next to him was Zechariah, then Jael, and Shimmeramoth, however you say that guy's name. Shh, yeah, let's skip it. Jehiel, Metatiah, Eliab, Benaniah, and Obed-Edom. Jael, with stringed instruments, harps. But Asaph made music with cymbals. Benaniah and Jehaziah, the priest, regularly blew the trumpet before the Ark of the Covenant of God. And on that day, verse 7, check this out. On that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Now, now think, think, you know, all of this is about surrounded. It's all about God, the worship of God. And David was the psalmist. He, he was writing the lyrics. He hands it to Asaph. He said, put music to it. And as Asaph grabs, you know, the lyrics, he begins to add the, the symbols and the, and the stringed instruments and a melody. And, you know, these would have been songs that the nation of Israel would have been singing to the Lord. And so they're, they're just there. David hands them the sheet. Now, what's, what's amazing, guys, these psalms that we're going to be reading are found in the book of Psalms as well. Verses 8 to verse 22 is Psalm 105. Verses 1 to 15, you, you can find the exact same passage in the book of Psalms 105. And when you get to verse 23, down to verse 33, it's Psalm 96, 1 through 13. It's, it's all 
put here in this psalm. And then in 34 to 36 is Psalm 106, verse 1, 47 and 48. So this would have been David handing off this psalm and using these lyrics. And, and they're going to be used in different songs down the road. Right, And so he's laying all of this out and he begins here to give thanks to the Lord. And that's what it was all about. He, he, he wanted to give God what was due him. He wanted to let God he, know that, that he acknowledged his might, his power, his majesty, his glory. And watch how he opens this up in verse 8. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord. That we are a thankful people. That we realize that, that everything we have is because God has given it to us. Your breath. I mean, we just sang that song, right? It, 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 he's, wor he's worthy of all of our praise. Even the very breath in our lungs is something he's given us. Everything. And that we, we acknowledge that, you know, God is the giver of life. He's the giver of, he's the sustainer of life, health, wealth, prosperity, talents, gifts. Everything you have is because God gave it to you. And that you, would, you and I would, 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 you know, be those who acknowledge that, you know, it, all of it's God. He created all of it. Anything you have, it's because God has entrusted it to you. And that we would, we would be those who give thanks to the Lord. I like what he says next in verse 8. He says, call upon his name. Right? That, that we would not only be thankful, but that would, we would be seeking him. And he's going to use that word several times in, the, in verse 11, you know, seek the Lord, seek the Lord, that we're, that we're, you know, in communion with him, that we're in conversation with God constantly. Now, his prayer isn't just something we do at, at, at lunchtime or breakfast or dinner. It, it's something we do, you know, in the middle of our work day, right? You know, when, when we're just kind of going through life's issues, is God, you know, going through this help? God, we're, we're in, I'm, 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 I got to go face this situation. God, give me wisdom. I got to deal with the kids. God, would, would you help me to show your grace and love? I and mean, we're constantly just, you know, in this open conversation with the Lord. And it, it's not like I got to go get alone, get in my closet. Make sure no one, you know, no one's going to bother. Man, it's just this. And, and he's saying, call upon the Lord. That's what a relationship with God looks like. That we're calling upon the Lord. That we're, look at the next part of verse 8. Making known his deeds. That we're declaring him to everyone that we have an opportunity to. Right? That, that we're making known his deeds. Man, let me tell you what God's done for me. Right, and he's constant in, in, in this whole you know psalm. He's he's reminding us, guys. This this is what someone who loves God, someone who has you know a desire to know God. This 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 is the actions that person takes. I'm calling upon the Lord. I'm giving thanks to the Lord. I'm making known His deeds among the peoples. You know, I, I I'm declaring who He is. And then look 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 at verse nine and love this. Sing to him, sing psalms to him. Remember, this would have been put to music. It would have, it would have been like the top 40, right there. It would have just been something that, you know, the, everyone in Israel, they would, have, they would have been singing this. It would have been that melody that just kind of over and over. You know, there's certain songs you just kind of, you can't get out of your head. Little rhymes when you're a kid. I can still say certain rhymes. You're just like, man, that's weird. I, you know, I was like... Four years old, how, how in the world do I still know that stuff? And I think that part of our memory is, is you know, and there's some things I put in my head as a, as a teenager, I wish I can get out, and I can't, right? <laughs> Those melodies that you just had in your head, you're like, oh, man, I, I didn't, it, it, you know, it's, it was wild. It, I remember getting saved and then hearing some of the songs that I used to know all the lyrics to. And not even realizing what they were saying, and you just kind of like, oh, that wasn't good, <laughs> right? I mean, that that was bad, you know. But you didn't even you didn't even kind of register. And and how important it is that we're taking, you know, the songs that are elevating God, and and you know just hiding them in our hearts. And and most of those are are, are songs that that are that are acknowledging God's greatness, God's goodness, God's faithfulness. And you're there, he's saying, sing to him, sing psalms to him. There it is again, talk of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. 
that we're, you know, to, to glory in the name of God, just to, to acknowledge that, man, he, he's his majesty. Now, to think about this. The Jews didn't even know how to say the name of God. They, they would replace the name of God and they would use YHVH. So, I mean, you know, you, you can, they took all the, the, the vowels out of the name of God because God's name was so holy that they wouldn't repeat it. And so all, all they were left with was, was YHVH. You know, how, how, do, how do you even say the name of God? Yuvu. YHVH. You know, I mean, Yuvu. No. And so some people, you know, say Yahweh. Some, some say, you know, Yehovah. It, but no one knows how God's name was actually pronounced because, because the Jews would, had, had removed that out of there. You and I have the name of Jesus. The name that's above every name. The Bible says this, that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow. Every tongue can confess that Jesus is Lord, right? So we have the name of Jesus. How much more should you and I be elevating the name of Jesus? We know his name. It's, it's not a mystery. It's not, it's not something that they you know that, that we... we have to assume or guess at it we we know that the name of jesus is the name that's above every other name and here he is he's, he's saying you know what man glory to his holy name and then look at this let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the lord seek the lord and his strength seek his face evermore remember his marvelous works which he's done his wonders and the judgment of his mouth O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, he, his, his chosen ones, right? And, and this, this whole idea of men seeking the Lord. They were, 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 were to seek his face. I like that. He's, you know, seek the Lord, seek his face, you know, long for him, get to know him. I, I believe you're here tonight because we're going, man, I, I just want to know God more. I want to be in his presence more. I want to, I want to grow in my relationship with him more. And guys, that, that's a commendable thing. And it should be something that, that you and I are longing for. Guys, that, that's the void that's in our hearts. Is when, when you know, you aren't doing those things, there, there's that lack. And when you are doing it, it you know, it, it fills that, that, that hole, that void that we have. Spending time with God. Seeking his face. Proclaiming his goodness. Right? And then check this out. I, I love this. Verse 14, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all of the earth. Remember his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now, Guys, I think this, this, this passage is, is important because what we're reminded is that when, when God declares something, it's not something that he undoes, unless he declares he undoes it, right? Because this is an everlasting covenant for a thousand generations. What's he talking about? Watch what he says. Saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance Guys, the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, that, that, that you and I know as, as the, the, the state of Israel right now, that was God's to give. And he gave it to the nation. Now, all of the, the accords and, and agreements and none of those things can change what God has declared. God's the one who gave that land. It's, it's his to give. He gave it to the nation of Israel. And, and right now, we, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of commotion going on. Iran's, you know, threatening them. And, and you, you got, you got the, the Palestinians that are wanting to take it back. And, you, you know, you got all of this commotion. Guys, the Middle East is, is constantly in, in, in turmoil. Because it's, it's, the fight isn't against Israel. The fight is against God. This is, this, this is a war that, that the nations of the world are trying to somehow undermine what God declares to be true. And so this, this whole idea of replacement theology, that you know, Israel was you know, no longer God's people. I have a hard time with that because here it says for a thousand generations. 
It, it, here, here it says that this is an everlasting covenant. This is God's doing. And so he lays that out for us. You know, this is their inheritance. Look at, look at verse 19. I love this. When you were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. You see, God took Abraham and his little family, and he had been walking through the land of Canaan, and God was protecting him the whole time. As he was in the midst of, you know, all of the, the enemies, all of those who, who, would, who would, you know, destroy him. And, and he reminds them in verse 30, 20 there. Watch what, what he, I love this. Watch this. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. No, no, notice what God's reminding the, the children of Israel. Look, I protected you this whole time. I've had my hand upon you. No king's been able to destroy you because I've had my hand upon you. No one's been able to wipe you out because I've had my protection. When Abraham went into Egypt, and if you guys remember the story, he went into Egypt and the king wanted to take his wife from him, Sarah. And he told Sarah, Sarah, you know, do me a favor, babe. They're going to kill me if they see you because you're so beautiful. That the king sees you, he's going to kill me so he can have you. So let's just tell them you're my sister, okay? It's just a little, you know, it's only a little kind of lie because, you know, we're really kind of related anyway, you know? <laughs> And he goes in, and sure enough, the king takes Sarah to, into his harem. And that night, the king had a dream. And God warned him, you know what? You touch that girl, you're dead. Right? I mean, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty serious stuff. Like, you know, you don't, don't mess with her. <laughs> that's his wife. You touch her. You're messing with me. You're, you're, you know, and everyone, all the, the women became barren. And, you know, he's like, okay, called Abram in, Abraham in, calls him and says, why did you lie to me? He goes, well, I thought you would kill me. He goes, you, turkey, almost brought destruction on my whole land. Get your wife and get out of here, right? God protected. And, and God reminds them, all this time I've protected you. There was moment after moment after moment that you could have been wiped out. But I've had my hand of protection upon you. How true of that is you? Is, is that of you and me? I, I remember before I came to the Lord, there were so many times that, man, I should have died. I, I remember one, I was in a car accident, man, T-boned. The, the bumper of the car that hit me was in the driver's seat, and somehow I was in the passenger seat. And I walked right out of the car, not one scratch on me. And, and to this day, I, I have no idea. I had my safety belt on. I mean, I have no idea how that, what, what happened. And I, I walked out. I'm sitting on the side of the road, and the police officer walks in and goes, hey, you know, who was in the driver's seat? I said, well, that was me. <laughs> and it, it just had that look of wonder, like, how in the world did you get out of there? Not a scratch, not, not a bruise, not, you know, and, and you just realize, you know what, this whole time God has, has had his hand as protection upon me. And that's true of you. I know a couple times I thought I was going to OD, man. I, I, I had taken too much drugs, and, and man, my heart racing out of my chest, and I thought, man, I, I, I'm not going to make it through this one. And crying out to the Lord, God, if you would just save me this time. I promise I'll quit. And then I would just, like God's presence, you know, just sober as can be and knowing. And then two weeks later, going back and doing the same stupid thing again, you know, and you just like, why, why, why did God rescue me? I have no idea. Other than his grace. And God's reminding the children of Israel, you know, look, I, I'm the one who's protected you. I, I'm the one who's sustained you this whole time. You're only alive because I've kept you alive and for many of us we, you, you, you can relate man it's just because of God's grace it's just because of God's favor he, you, you have no you know other reason that then, then God has been gracious to you just as he's been to me man and you know God's reminding them of these things 
Now we turn to Psalm 96. It's there in verse 23. He says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nation, his wonders among all the peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all the gods, be above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. I like that. Now, in our government schools, you won't hear that. But it's true. The Lord's the one who made the heavens. He's the one who made life. He, you know, he's the creator of all things. And he's saying, look, he's worthy to be praised. He gets all the glory. He's to be feared above all the gods of this world. You know, all the other gods are idols. You know, and anything else someone else worships besides the Lord God, it's, it's idolatry. But the Lord, the creator, he's worthy of our praise. And, and he reminds us of that. You know, here, you know, he made the heavens. Look at verse 27. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his, in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Not a great passage. The beauty of holiness. You know, there's something that, that, that is just majestic about God's holiness. And that God's desire is that you and I be holy. The word holy, I think sometimes we, we, we think that word like, you know, oh, you think you're holier than thou. Or, you know, we, we, we have this weird concept of holiness. Holiness just means that you're set apart for God. That your, your, your life isn't to be used for the mundane or for the, the, the vanity of this world. That your life is set apart for God. That your life is, look, my, everything I have is his. Everything I do is it's all his. That's what holiness is. That I, I don't separate the secular from the, the holy, right? From the sacred. It's like, well, I just, I just got a normal job. I, you know, I pound nails all day. Or I, or I work at, you know, the restaurant. Or I just, you know, I, no, there's no such thing as, as secular if you're a child of God, you're holy. And what you do, which how you live, should be holy. That I'm set apart for God. I, I, I'm not one way in one environment and another way in another environment. My life is set apart for God all the time. That's the idea. And, and he's reminding us of this thing, you know, that, that we're, we're to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That our, our life is to, is to be set apart for his glory, for his, for his purpose. And, and then he reminds us, look at verse 30, tremble before him. If you have an old King James Version, it says, fear him. And let me just translate for you. Fear him. <laughs> That's what it means. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because having a healthy fear of God is a good thing. Right? And, and, and we, 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 somehow we, we, we want we to, you know, like we, we shouldn't fear God. No, you should. You're going to stand before him one day. <laughs> He's the one who's in control of everything. There should be a healthy fear. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you know, like, oh, I don't want to come before him. I'm trembling. No, it should, like, like, I have a great respect, a great honor, a great adoration for God. And, and we should tremble before him. We should fear him. And, and the, the, the psalmist is, David's reminding us, you know, fear him, all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It is not, it shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice, the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let, not, let the sea roar in all of its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Then the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord for, check this out, he is coming to judge the earth. 
Guys, all the way, all the way back here in, in, in you know, the life of David, going, look, God, one day, he, he's going to come to judge the earth. He's, he's going to set everything right. He, everything's going to be in order. God is going to bring righteousness and truth and judgment to a world that's rejecting him. And, 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 you know, those of us who know him, those who love him, and we long for that. I, I can't wait. Lord, come back today. I can't wait for his return. Now, if you're not walking with the Lord, you're going, don't talk like that. <laughs> I remember before I got saved, my mom would always tell me, Jesus is coming back. I, I used to think, no. <laughs> I don't want him to come back. Not yet. I mean, Wait. But one day he is coming back. And, and the way things are looking, guys, I don't think we're that far off. You look at what's going on in our world. You look at what's going on, you know, in, in, our, in, in the nations of the world. You're just like, man, we're, we're prime right now. All of the biblical prophecies have already been fulfilled. We're just waiting for a couple little pieces to kind of fall into place. And what's interesting right now with, with Russia and China and Iran all becoming a coalition of nations along with many of the other you know, Middle Eastern nations that, that are talking because we as a nation are no longer doing the things that we declared we would do. And, and what's, what, the, the, we're, we're pushing them into each other's arms right now as, as, as a nation. And, and you realize that, you know what, we're, we're becoming weaker and weaker. Our military, weaker and weaker. We're not the superpower that we once were. And, and you just realize that all of these things are happening just the way the Bible declared they would happen. Ezekiel 38, guys, is already ready to go down. And, and he lists the nations that are going to come against the nation of Israel. And as you look at those nations, man, as you look at current day events, you just realize, man, all of those things are already in motion. And you just, you're just like, man, it could happen any moment. It, 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 just, just a few events take place, and we're there, right? And, and you know, we, we, we got to keep that the forefront of our hearts, that they, one day the judge is coming, the, the king is coming. He's coming to Judge the earth. Look, look at verse 34 now. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. And say, save us, O God, of our salvation. Gather us together, together. Deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. And so, you know, he, he, we come to the end of the psalm. And at the end of the psalm, and, and what does it say? And all the people said... You thought that was just a Pentecostal thing, didn't you? And all the people said, amen, amen right? <laughs> that's, that's a psalm. They were, that word amen means so be it or, or, or truth, right? And, and, and as, the, as all of them are saying it together, they're saying we're in agreement. It's kind of like when we clap at the end of a song. You know, it's kind of like, man, I, what we just sang, man, that's true. The thing we just declared, it, it, it's it's it's. What I'm declaring, we're not, we're not clapping for the team that's singing. No offense to you, David. We're not clapping for you. We're, 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 when we're clapping, we're going, man, that's, that's truth right there. I'm in agreement with that. And that's what they're doing here. Amen. And they're declaring that. Now, look what he says in verse 37. So he left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant. Of the Lord to minister before the Ark of the regularly as every day's work required. And Obed Edom and his eight and his sixty-eight brethren, including Obed Edom and the sons of Jeduthun and Hosea to be gatekeepers, and Zaduk the priest and his brethren, the priest, before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place that was at Gibeon, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offerings regularly, here it is, morning and evening uh, to do according to the all that was written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. And with them, Haman and Judathan and the rest who were chosen, 
who were designated by name to give thanks to the Lord because his mercy endures forever. And with them, him and, and Judith, them, the to sound aloud with trumpet and cymbals and the music, musical instruments of God. Now the sons of Judatham were gatekeepers and all the people departed, every man to his house, and David returned to bless his house. Now, I mean, you know, think about, I mean, what, what a day that would have been. You know, David is like, man, the, the house of God here, we worship the Lord, we sang to the Lord, we offered sacrifice to the Lord. I mean, you know, he, he came to the end of that and David was on cloud nine. Right, just there, excited, man. You know, finally, finally, I've been longing for this moment. I've been waiting for this day. And he's there in his house, chapter 17. This is cool. Watch what he says. It came to pass that David was dwelling in his house. And David said to Nathan the prophet. Now, you know, David's hanging out with Nathan the prophet. They're there in the city of David. Nathan the prophet. You'll remember Nathan. Nathan's the one who rebukes him when he fell into sexual sin with Bathsheba. Right? This is that same Nathan. So Nathan was a man who had a, a, you know, a great relationship with God. He, he would, God would speak to Nathan. And Nathan was there with David. And David comes out and he says, So now I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains? And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. And what David's declaring is, look, I'm in my beautiful home. You know, I got cedar walls. I, it, it, would, it would have been, you know, a mansion. It would have been a, a, a place of, of, of great substance. And David's going, look, I, I'm dwelling in this beautiful home, and God's out there in a tent? Something's wrong with this picture, right? And, and I, I think David, after experiencing this whole event that had taken place he was just like man I, I just want to give God more I just I, I, I just want to give God my everything and and so he's he's proposing to build God a house and Nathan hears it and and I love this that you know here you got a prophet who also makes mistakes that's encouraging <laughs> he jumped the gun because we're going to find out that God's going to tell Nathan Nathan why, why, why did you tell him to do that I don't want him to do that and he's going to have to go and correct what he just did, right? So Nathan's going, hey, whatever, you know, God's with you, David, whatever you, and I think for all of us, guys, it should be that, that, you know, moment in our own lives where we're going, wait a second, just because I'm doing something good doesn't make it always right. Just because you're doing something good doesn't make it right. You got to be seeking the heart of God. There's a lot of good things to do in life. There's a lot of noble things you can do. Are you doing what God's called you to do? And Nathan here, you know, is giving his blessing. And then he goes home and watch what, he, what happens. It happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. Uh-oh. <laughs> You're not going to go tell David that what you said was wrong. You never listened to me. You know, you didn't ask me. You, you, you just made an assumption because it's something good that it was something that was right. And I don't, that's not his place. That's not his position. And I don't want him to build me a house. And, and you know, think about how Nathan had to feel at that point. I, I, I overextended my own position, right? My own, I, I, I spoke for God when I shouldn't have spoke to, for God. And now God's coming to correct me. You know, I mean, you know, what, 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 a, what a humbling place to be. And now he's got to go and tell David. And watch this, guys. This, this, this is good. For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day. But have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. Wherever I have moved about with all of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? And God says, look, have I ever complained to you about living in a tent? Do you think that really bothers me? I, 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 have, I haven't ever, ever been in a place where I wanted a house of cedar. So David, you know what, that, that's, that's not something that, that I'm concerned about. Guys, I, 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 I love this because we'll find out 
from earlier passages that David was a man of war. He was a man of blood. Solomon was going to be a man who had never shed blood. And he was going to be the one who builds his house. David's not the man for that job. And now Nathan goes back and goes, look, I want you to go tell David for me that that's not, his, that's not, that's not going to be his position. That's not going to be his, his task in mind to build me a house. And it's not something that I even really care about, to be honest with you. That's what God's telling Nathan. Oh, you know, don't, don't, don't tell David not to, not to be hurt because I, it's not something that, that I'm impressed with. I, I don't need a house. The heavens are his tabernacle, right? God, God doesn't need it. And then check this out. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you've gone and have cut off all of your enemies from before you and have made you a name like the name of great men who are on the earth. Now, God's turning the tables on David. He said, David, don't forget. I'm the one who took you from being a little shepherd boy and made you the king over Israel. That was me. It, it, this isn't about you, David. This is about me, David. Guys, I, I, I love this passage because, because you see, Nathan's going to go to David and say, David, don't forget where you come from. You were a nobody. You were a nothing. I took you when you were, you were out there, you know, sleeping with sheep every night and I take you from that position and I elevate you to this position of being the king over Israel to shepherd my people. And the way he, he the way this is phrased, it's, it's God saying, look, I've done these things for you. As God's able to take shepherds and make them kings. God's able to take the lowly and elevate them to positions of, of great responsibility and great, great importance because, you see, God's the one who lifts up and God's the one who takes down. God's not impressed with us. He's, he, he, he's just looking for a man after his own heart. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't you know, think, oh, that guy's talented. i got to get him on my team. God's just looking for a man or woman who says, God, I, I don't have much, but I'll give you what I got. When we get to 2 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 16, or, or no, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, where it says, the, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro through the whole earth, seeking those whose heart is loyal to me that I might show myself strong on their behalf. I love that passage because it's just, you know, God's looking for men and women who, who, who just, you know, have a loyal heart to him. They're, they're not looking to be elevated. They're not looking for, for, you know, for prominence for themselves. They're just looking to be used by God. God, I'm, I'm a vessel. You want to take me, do whatever you want with me. And, and David is in this place where, where God's saying, David, don't forget, I'm the one who took a shepherd boy and made him a king. I'm the one, and he's going to use this I will over 10 times in these next few passages. Because God's reminding them that this is my doing, David. I'm the one that's established you. Watch what he says. I've given you a name above the great men of the earth. Think about that. Out of all the great men of the earth, I mean, you know, to this day, David is at the top of that list. You can look at, at presidents that have come and gone, right? I, I, I can't even recite to you all the presidents of the United States, but I, I, I tell you what, I, I know about King David. His name is still up there as the great men of the earth. 
Right? And God's reminding them. Look what he says, verse 9. He says, Moreover, I have appointed a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, and they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will take my mercy I, I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you, speaking of Saul, and I will establish him in my house and up in my kingdom forever, and his throne, check this out, shall be established forever. And here, here, here's what God's telling David. David, you want to build me a house? Let me tell you something. I'm building you a house. In which you desire is a good thing, David, but, but you know what? That's not your job. I, I got plans for you. I'm going to build you a house. And from your seed is going to come a, 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 a kingdom that's not going to ever be moved. It's going to be forever. Now, what, what, check this out, guys. Turn real quick. We got one passage we're going to turn to tonight. Go to Luke chapter 1 with me. New Testament, the Gospel of Luke. Look at chapter 1. I love this. Luke chapter 1, look at verse 30. Mary is being visited by an angel. And watch what happens. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the Son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Watch this. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Here it is. And his kingdom there will be no end. Guys, that was the fulfillment of the promise that God had given to David. It was from his lineage that Jesus came into this world. And this promise that God's going, I'm, I'm going to establish your house and it's going to be a, it's going to be a never ending kingdom. And, he, and, and the reference was to Jesus who is the eternal king. Right? Forever and ever and ever. And he lays all of this out for him. And he tells him there in verse 15, and according to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And I love David's response. Look at verse 16. And King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you brought me this far? Because David didn't get bitter at God. He didn't go, God, that's not fair. You know, I mean, how come I can't build you a house? You know, that, he, he just realized, you know what, God, who am I? That you've done with me what you've done with me is, is a miracle as it is. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's not for me to say what you want. All I can do is, you know, pursue those things. You have to open the doors. And I've seen people become bitter at God because, you know, they, you know, wanted to be on the mission field or they, you know, they had some plan for their own life or, you know, God, I wanted, you know, that husband or I got, I wanted that girl. And, you know, and, and you, you, you just get to this place where, where, you know, the reality is, is you're telling God what you want rather than saying, God, what do you want? And whatever God desires for you, that that's better than anything you're going to get for yourself. Being content with where God has you in your life. You know, and, and you, you, can, you can just become like, well, that's not fair. It's not fair. I'm going to marry an evil guy now. That's it. No, no. You just, whatever God has for you, that, that's the best that he has for you. You've got to wait on the Lord. Be content with. And David didn't get angry or bitter or, or you know, frustrated. Or he just says, God, I, I'm nobody. That, that, you know, you would allow me to do what I do. I can't even believe you do that. That you would choose me to, to, 
mop floors. You know, you would choose me to serve your children. You would choose me to do the, the things that I get to do for your kingdom. I mean, what more can I ask for than that? It's understand, and I, and I love that David had that, that heart, man. Look at this. And yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O oh God. You've also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree. Oh, Lord God. He goes, God, you, you, you've put me in a position that you elevated me to a place I never expected to be. And, you know, that you've made me a man of high degree. Guys, this is the cool thing. You might think, well, I'm not a man of high degree. Let me tell you something. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're the son of a king. You've been elevated to a place of favor. That God has shown you so much grace and goodness, and you're going to be with him for all of eternity. I mean, which of us have deserved that? Seriously. Because you know where you've come from. I know what I deserve, man. I've failed God. I, 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 I rebelled against God. I, I've done things that I'm ashamed of in my past, you know, before I came to Christ. And, and, and that God, God would take all of that and he goes, you know what? It's all forgiven. It's all wiped out. And now I'm going to take your life. I'm going to make something of it for me, for, your, for my kingdom. Only God. Only God. His grace, his mercy, his love, you know, all of it on display for us. And, and I, you know, David gets it. And, and, and if you understand, you know, who you are and, and where you come from, you get it. You know, just like, God, you, you would choose me to be your own special treasure. You would pick me to, to be your workmanship. I'm your poem. I'm the one that you're going you're gonna to use for your glory. I, I didn't, it, that's beyond my capacity to comprehend. And David gets it. You know, he's just like, God, that you would, you would allow me to, to do that. Look, look at verse 18. What more can David say to you for the honor of your servant? For you know your servant. O oh Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness in making known all these great things. O oh Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with, your, with, with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds, by driving out nations from before your people whom you've redeemed from Egypt, and you have made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever, and do as you have said. Let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established before you, for you, oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. Wow. Wow. Here, 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 here's David's conclusion. He says, God, that you would even entertain this idea that, that you're, you're, you're going to establish my, my, my house, that, that I'm going to be the instrument you're going to use to bring forth the, you know, the, a forever kingdom, that, that God, how can I even complain about anything? Why, why, would, why would I even say a word against you, God, that you've been so gracious, you've been so good, that you take nothing and you make something. You, you, t you take what's been discarded and you make it your own treasure. And guys, that, I, you know, you just, you just realize is that that's how God works. That's what he does. He takes the nobodies. He takes the nothings. 
Matter of fact, he tells us in, in Corinthians where, where he says that God has taken the base things of this world, the things that are not, to confound the wise, right? He takes the foolish. And then he pours his grace upon that life. And, and you know, that, that's what he does for us. We deserved hell, and he gave us heaven. We, we, were, we, we, we were vile, and he made us pure and holy before him by his blood. God. And I, I think David's in a place of just astonishment and amazement, as you and I should always be, that, that you know, God's working in us, that he, that he loves us, that he desires to use us for his kingdom, for his glory. If he would just come and, and say, God, take my life and use it. That's all he's looking for. And it may not be what you, what you would expect, or what, you know, but, but it, that he would do anything is, a, is an amazing thing, right? <laughs> that he would do anything. And, and you, you, you look at the, this whole idea, and David just said, God, that's, that's why I come to you. I, I just want to pray to you. I just, I just want to acknowledge you as my king, my Lord. And then, he, closing verse here, I love, look, look what he says. And now, Lord, you are God, and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. And here's what David's saying. God, what you said, I believe. The things you declared, God, I, I, I'm all in. I said, that, that's really all that you and I have been, been given the responsibility to do. God, I, I, what you say about me, God, I could believe it. You see, because the devil wants to come and tell you, you know what, you're a creep and you're no good and you failed and you messed up this many times and God's not going to forgive you and God doesn't love you. And, and, and the enemy's constantly trying to lie to us, constantly. And when you and I have been given the responsibility, God, I, I don't believe the lies. I believe what you say. I believe what you declare. I believe the truth that you have promised. And as you by faith believe the things that God says about you, if you believe the things that God declares, then you begin to walk with, 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 a, with a confidence that it's God who forgives. It's God who loves me. The, 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 the enemy wants to condemn me, but God wants to forgive me. You see, I, I, don't, I don't fall into this trap that, that I'm going to believe the lies any longer. I want to believe the things that God declares. And David just, just said, God, I agree. <laughs> I want what you want. I, I, I just, now, you know what's cool, guys? It, you, and and we'll, we'll cover some of this later, but Solomon ends up building the temple, right? We, we, we know that and it, was, it was a magnificent temple. But David, for the rest of his life, is gathering together the gold and the silver and he's preparing all of the wealth and all of the resources so that Solomon could build the temple. And I, lo I, love, I love that David said, you know what, I, I'm not going to be there to do it. I'm not going to be there to, you know, to, to see it in my own eyes. But you know what, if God, you promised that my son was going to do it, man, I want to set up everything so that he could be the one who's been given this great privilege of building your temple. Because it's for your kingdom, that's what matters. And guys, that we would be kingdom-minded people. Seriously, you know, whatever God wants to do, if, if I were to die and, and it would be the next generation that God's gonna use to bring revival, man, if I can just be some part of it, if I can have just some, some ability to just prepare for that's gonna happen, what a privilege that is. That you and, you and I, I mean, I, my prayer is that, that we would see God just blow this place out of the water. That we, we, we would have to go to 10 services, right? Whatever it takes, man, because we can't fit people in the door. I, I want to see revival. But if I don't get to see it, that we can prepare for the next generation to see it, then so be it. And I, I just want to make sure that we're doing the things that God's given us the privilege to do for his glory.